Well, thank you all for coming here. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to my talk, Optimization Gems from Jaeger. And to start off, I'd like to introduce myself. Um, I, my name is Joachim Olander, and I'm a senior game engineer here at Jaeger. Um, I have worked here at Jaeger for four and a half years. And during my time here at Jaeger, I primarily worked on two games. Uh, they're specifically called Dawn 2 and Dreadnought. However, where I specifically have worked at Jaeger for four and a half years, uh, Jaeger have actually worked with Unreal Engine for 13 years. Um, and that's quite a lot of experience, especially with Unreal Engine 4, which was, has been over six years. Um, now, this talk is specifically about the experiences we have had during our six years at, with Unreal Engine 4, especially in regards for optimization and using the engine as a third-party developer trying to create some really cool, awesome games. Um, and uh, to start here during this, this introduction, I'd like to give um, a couple of small learnings that I think are kind of more global and the way we approach when we have to optimize specifically for our game. Um, the first one, uh, how the engine sometimes decides to behave, is this kind of concept of reliability over performance. Um, and I'd like to show this by talking a little bit about network relevancy. So um, here is a map of Dreadnought, um, and we have two players. Uh, they're called Sam and Joe. Now, Sam and Joe are of two opposite teams, and they are very far of a different distance on the map. Um, they can certainly see each other on the scoreboard. Uh, they can write very angry chat messages between each other, and in general, cause a lot of uh, flame between each other. However, they can't really see each other, uh, both because our level designers have put on vision blockers, but also because th the relevancy distance are not overlapping. Um, however, to really prove and be able to kill each other based on their trash talk, uh, they can go towards the center, which means both of the relevancy distance overlaps, which means we have to create the ships, we have to destroy them, and yeah, let's see what, who wins. Um, there is another way, though, we could spawn these individual actors, and that's specifically using this function called uh, net multicast reliable. So let's take the specific example where Joe has this specific function and the server invokes it. Now, if you were like a programmer and you kind of would expect a reliable function to be primarily managing UDP connections, such as drop, uh, drop packages and in general ordering, um, it also handles to make sure it hits every single connection. So the previous natural relevancy I showed you it changes based on this. So Joe, for instance, becomes now relevant on all connections, regardless of distance, specifically for invocation of this function. Now, it's completely fine, and it's like completely understandable why Epic specifically has made this. Uh, while certainly I could see certain use cases of it not being true, um, this is a really, um, this is sort of like a lot of people scripting blueprints, a lot of people try out things, and in general, um, it's sort of fine. Um, however, we are third-party developers, and we're able to put more consideration into our specific optimization. And for me, this is a specific case where if we make a couple of minor engine changes and make sure that we check relevancy specifically for our net multicast functions, we are able to remove this kind of relevancy requirement. Because the cost is real if you invoke this function on a sort of non-always relevant actor. Because what happens after this function has been processed is we go back to our normal relevancy distance, and Joe would be destroyed again on Sam's PC, who's very far away. Um, so we have paid the whole creation cost, then the whole uh, execution cost of this specific U function, and then the destruction of Joe under a couple of frames. And that's quite expensive. Um, and that's sort of the first one where, yeah, the function, the system, the engine might be a little bit more reliable than performant. Um, uh, the second part I'd like to also mention that, in general, I think every third-party developer needs to think about when you're working on Unreal Engine is that it's made for all games. Um, and sometimes not even games. Like, when I've been here around and talked about with people with Unreal Fest, there is a bunch of people here that are not working on games, but potentially automation for cars or movies or a lot of those things. Um, that might be potentially then why the engine is sometimes not specifically set up all, everything for your game. And it might be actually certain code paths that you can specifically optimize to really hit your specific performance benchmark. Um, and I know it can be a little bit scary, but Epic doesn't have the context completely over how your game is. So it's quite impossible for them to create the best code path that works for every single video game. And that's what specifically this talk is about. This talk is called Optimization Gems from Jaeger, where I will share a couple of key learnings that we have had here at Jaeger, where we have optimized our games to run really efficient in Unreal Engine. Um, these gems uh, that I will present will be free. Um, I'll first start talking about a performance tracker, uh, then I'll talk about multiple animated components into one, and then I'll finish up with network pooling. Um, so let's begin. Um, the first one is about performance tracker. 
Um, and before I start talking about the performance tracker, I'd like to give a shout out to Oliver Neumann, who primarily were the driver and implementer of this system, and also to Oliver Stubbenrach, who did a talk here previously, and Florian, who set up the content in general, tuned the system to work great. Um, I'm just here presenting it. <laughs> Um, so, to start talking about the performance tracker, um, it generally starts with the problem always about optimization. And that is that we always want our frame rate to run at a constant speed, however, nothing is equal. Um, you have potentially one frame where you have 40, 50 explosions happening, and then you might have another frame where you just have four buttons and a couple of backend callbacks. And then you have frames that is everything in between. And all of these things are inconsistent, but our, play, uh, our players, and in general us when we play our games, we expect our game to run at a constant speed. Also, all these inconsistent frame obviously runs on different platform and different hardware, which causes a lot of different problems for us. So obviously what you do then is you provide, you optimize, you profile, and you provide optimizations for those. That's the normal way that you work with optimization, and it's always the clear and awesome route to go with it. Um, and this is great. Um, however, sometimes it can be quite staff and resource intensive. Uh, we are a third party developer. We have worked with consoles. We have worked with, on PC. We ha currently have a live game that's called Dreadnought. Um, and we want to make live updates and continuously patch this game over and over and over again. Um, but making sure that every single PC hardware is running super nice when we want to patch the game maybe every week or every second week can take a lot of time and can take a lot of resources. Um, so sometimes it can just take time, but sometimes we're going to have to do it. Um, we were very inspired by a couple of new changes that have happened for the Unreal Engine, uh, especially one that is the dynamic resolution scaling, where it specifically checks the render thread and in general uh, changes the resolution based on how the game is doing. Um, now, that is specifically for rendering, and we were thinking of if there would be a way where we could create a system that was a little bit more broader. And that's to some extent what the performance tracker is about. Uh, the performance tracker is trying to be reactive to specific frame rate changes. Um, and how we basically define the frame rate changes is we have five states. Um, these are ranking from very bad to very good, where OK would be basically hitting your exact normal average frame rate. Now, what we do then is we don't have one set of tuning always that is attached to a component. We have tuning for each of these five different states. And based on how the, we have defined how the game is doing, we will apply that specific tuning. Um, and we, if we, for instance, switch between very good to bad, we wouldn't obviously instantly switch to the, those tuning variables of bad. We would primarily do a lerp up to bad. So where I say we have five different tuning states defined, whatever tuning is applied is some kind of thing in the middle there. Um, and that's pretty cool. And that's kind of the idea for us about the performance tracker. Um, so to go a little bit more in detail, uh, what we do is we want to calculate the state that we have here. And what we do is we take the last 90th frame that ever happened in the game, and we get, get the average. Uh, we also amount to hitches and store them separately, so if you want to apply some specific hitch tuning or something to react to that, that's awesome. And then I think we do the third thing, which I think is really, really cool, is we do future prediction. So there's always a couple of operations that's always going to be expensive. Uh, even though Epic has done a really good job optimizing the garbage collection system, it's still going to always be a little bit, uh, take some time. Also, uh, there's a couple of operations that sometimes can uh, appear out of nowhere and you're weak from shipping. Uh, be able to say to this state calculation that, hey, this will take 20 frames, uh, please uh, put this in your state calculation and see if you can do something, might be a better option than trying to change that core system in a, a week before shipping, because that might risk your whole release. Um, so this is in general how we are calculating this state, and then we kind of have said, okay, we're in one of these five states. Um, we visualize it in the game, so if you remember the text I had previously in colors, well, we show it in a bar here, and then we have this pin in the middle which basically shows where we are. Uh, we have some text that basically shows the, this kind of future prediction and what our average frame rate was, and then tuning we have applied. It's pretty cool. Um, however, this is the first step, basically, for us to calculate the state. And obviously, the second part is that we need to inform the specific subsystems and make them react with their tuning. Um, now, I can go through a lot of examples and probably spend 45 minutes talking about all the different subsystems that exist at Epic and for our game that we have specifically optimized. Um, the one that was the most important for ours was particles. Um, and I will show you here based on a gameplay video of Dreadnought. So if you don't know what Dreadnought is, it's you have a big giant spaceship, uh, you play with friends who have big giant spaceships, and you guessed it, you try killing other people with big giant spaceships. 
Um, now, something that's great with performance uh, is that these ships move very slow. Uh, they're giant. In general, they take some time to shoot. However, they pack a lot of firepower, and this firepower moves very, very quick, and it's very, very dynamic and intense. And one more thing that is super hard with it as well is it's a lot of event-driven stuff. You might have uh, a lot of frames where these ships are moving very, very slow, and then you might have frames like this where there is like hundreds of missiles, explosions, all the stuff is happening, and they're all very, very different frames and have all this stuff. Like, we could have 16 of these explosions. Um, and that's very hard, and that's in general a very event-based approach. Um, and that's where the performance tracker for us really works. Um, and what really inspired us to really do this system and what we got really motiv motivated by is, is because we developed this in 4.13, and in 4.12, Epic added the significant system for particles, where you're able to regulate basically particle LOD in a way more efficient manner. Um, now, I won't spend a lot of time talking about particle significance here. Uh, there's a guy, I think he's in the other talk, who called Florian Sender. He's also going to be uh, at the party later. You can talk to him exactly how we set it up, and he also created a bunch of those cool explosions you saw previously. Um, but significance is not the only thing we touch by performance tracker. We do a bunch of gameplay-specific optimizations. And to specifically talk about this, I will show you the exact video, but talk about something else. So, um, you see we have a lot of things happening here on the screen. We have an explosion, we have a lot of muscle effects when you shoot, we have a lot of hit impact feedback, and we also have these cool thrusters. Now, they look really cool in this kind of frame because the game is running really well. But however, if you're running at like five frames per second or something like that, then these thrusters are never going to look cool. So what we do sometimes is we hide them, or we might play around with tuning variables, such as like how often we tick them, like all this stuff. Um, you might not 100% see, but actually, while I said this frame runs really well, we're actually oscillating between very good and just okay while this whole gameplay is running. Uh, but as we are linearly interpolating all the tuning variables, you guys are probably not noticing the difference. And if you are, well, I guess you're, I'm just a programmer, so who knows. <laughs> um, so um, what I want to say is this was an example about how we specifically were reading frame state and then in general applying different tuning stuff, and it's really, really cool. Um, and if you would like to create something separate, then please do. Um, I just really want to emphasize that um, like, the manager that you create will always be unique for yours. So please, like, find the specific optimization and manager that is very key for your game when you're trying to read frame state and apply tuning. There's obviously some generic ones, like skeletal mesh components and, and particles, potentially, but there is always going to be those specific game-specific optimizations that's relevant for you. So to summarize the performance tracker, um, we, had the, we always have the general problem that we want our frame rate to run at a constant speed. However, not every frame is equal, not every hardware is equal, not every platform is equal. It's in general very challenging, but fun. Um, we created a performance tracker to try basically being more reactive towards frame state changes, and we applied tuning based on this specific behavior. Um, and that's the performance tracker in a nutshell. Cool. So, we're going to talk about the second gem. Um, the second gem is called Multiple Animated Component into One. And to start off this gem, um, I will show another video of Dreadnought. However, a little bit less explosions in this one. So a huge part of Dreadnought is customizing your specific ship. Um, you apply different abilities, and you apply different weapons, and they can be in very different nature. They might be supportive to help your team out, or they might be about killing all the other guys, or something in between. Um, so they have always a very different kind of unique aspect that they give the ship that you want to build. Um, however, one specific technical constant is there are always specific, unique skeletal mesh components attached to this ship. Um, and they're not just one or two, there are a lot. So if I show this image of Dreadnought, and I apologize for my bad programmer circles, uh, you can see me trying to basically highlight a couple of places where they are, but I certainly miss probably around 80% of them. It's also important that this is a 2D image, because a lot of them are hiding below and wherever artists decided to add these things. Now, um, normally when you work with performance optimizations, you have benchmarks. Um, and we had a benchmark on uh, Epic PC that we wanted to get up to 60 frames per second. Um, and currently it was running around 21 frames per second. Um, and you can probably guess if you are a little bit of a detective by me mentioning these specific attached skeletal mesh components, where they were quite expensive on this specific benchmark. Uh, they were 12 milliseconds expensive. 
this is still an average, and I was planning originally to go in way more detail, um, but uh, I don't have time. So it was around like a 12 millisecond average to run all the logic on these specific things, uh, primarily on game thread, but there's a lot of render thread and just in general how the engine is managing components. So we tried optimizing these specific things. Um, so the first of the obvious ones is just play around with a lot of tuning variables. So we did stuff such as like max draw distance, so if the ship is very far away, we might destroy the components. Um, we might show us some specific meshes that is locally on the ship itself, but it not on all the other players. Uh, we obviously, there's a bunch of nice component variables on the skeletal mesh components and even more introduced that makes the component way more optimized and a, a lot of platform optimizations from MinSpec and all that stuff. Uh, but as you remember a little bit that I was talking previously from the benchmark numbers I was showing, this was specifically on our epic, super cool PC that we wanted to run at 60 frames per second. And to get that to 60 frames per second, we really didn't want to call it because then it looks way worse. And you being able to see your ship with all this cool stuff you added to your game and really trying to use that to kill other people, um, that's something we want to show. Um, so with, however, with these tuning variables, um, we saved around 1.5 milliseconds which was pretty sweet. Um, we were at then at 19.5 milliseconds, uh, but that means still that we were around 10.5 milliseconds specifically for these attached skeletal mesh components. Um, so to analyze the problem a little bit more, um, our basic issue is that we just have too many components. Um, and this is nothing fault from Epic or something. We, I don't think they made the skeletal mesh component to be like 130 skeletal mesh component on a base actor that moves every frame. Um, and in general, why the skeletal mesh component, or in general, why sometimes these kind of components can be expensive, is that they're complex. Uh, the skeletal mesh component specifically is like also for 3D characters that are doing class simulation. Uh, while certainly there's a lot of tuning variables and a lot of things you can turn off, it's still going to have a certain overhead that you can't really get away from. Um, Epic provides a specific solution somewhat to this problem, which is called the skeletal mesh merger. Um, the skeletal mesh merger, what it simply does is it takes a lot of different skeletal meshes, um, it looks at a specific parent topology, and then builds a giant skeleton based on all the different unique bones that came from these different skeletal meshes. Um, it then generates the rendering data, the different LOD sets, and then outputs one skeletal mesh that you can attach to one component. And that's really, really cool, and we used it a lot during Dreadnought. Um, even though I showed you spaceships before, we also have captains and characters. And these are all built by different kinds of parts that are then kind of merged together using the skeletal mesh merger, and they look pretty sweet. Um, now, this is uh, cool for this specific use case. Uh, however, it didn't natively work specifically for us. Um, the main reason is because all these weapons are unique and have their own little life. Um, like, based on where the player is looking, or if, like, whatever gameplay decides, it might be that this weapon is firing, and then that weapon is firing, and this w might play some idle animation, or maybe something different. Uh, they're all unique, and they're all supposed to have their own kind of feeling and bring movement to your big giant ship. So, and the issue is that the skeletal mesh merger uh, removes these kind of unique bones and all that stuff, so it becomes a little bit of a problem. Um, and then also, uh, we are runtime deciding. So if we, for instance, had this ship and we knew exactly how the mesh was going to do and we did a lot of attached skeletal mesh components, certainly we could find, it, like, we could create some animation content or something that would, like, animate all these specific parts and read this stuff. But we could have this mesh on different classes of dreadnoughts, and it would be, like, it, it would be at different positions and different animations and all the different combinations than they had. Um, so we couldn't provide really, um, we couldn't really use the basic uh, skeletal mesh merger. Um, and this is really where I try, like, saying again, where sometimes we have unique problems for our game, and we're going to have to sometimes open up the engine and optimize it or find our solution specifically for our game. So that's what we did. Um, so the skeletal mesh merger is almost there. Um, it does output only one skeletal mesh. Uh, the prime issue is that it just takes the unique bones and not uh, a lot of bones. So we extended it that instead of it just creating unique bones, it instead duplicates all the different bones. Um, so we basically say, take this skeletal mesh and then create 14 of them, or whatever amount we wanted. Um, and then what we do is for all these different submeshes, uh, we uh, basically make them link to the root node. Um, and then we run through the normal loop, which is just create the rendering data, the LOD, the materials, um, and output a skeletal mesh. And what's super cool is it worked. Um, we were, able to have th we were able to have this kind of data in a skeletal mesh, and it worked really, really fine. We were able to have this kind of data set. 
Um, however, this is just 50% into this gem, because you could imagine that we're, I have been able to create a skeletal mesh that specifically contains this kind of bone topology. Um, we need to animate it. And if I'm going to be honest, no animation instance in the world would be able to animate this specific um, blueprint because, yeah, I modified the skeletal mesh merger, so I'm not going to be able to do, run the normal animation blueprint. Um, so we needed to find another way. Um, now, there's probably some people from Epic in the audience or in general across this thing that can explain to you way more better how Epic's animation system work. Um, I'll just talk very briefly about some of the points. Um, there is a component, the skeletal mesh component. Uh, there's the animation instance, which to a large extent represents the whole animation blueprint. And then there's animation proxy, which primarily handles the multi-threading and some of the bone updating. All of this stuff probably have changed over and over again. It's in general always in flux um, and always improved. Um, now, as I mentioned previously, I couldn't really use an animation blueprint for this. Uh, however, I could use the component. So we were always using the skeletal mesh component for this data set. Uh, however, the animation instance and the animation proxy did not work for our case. Um, so what we did is trying our best to create this kind of small animation update object. Um, and that really worked, and it's not really that much code. Uh, it primarily touched three specific sections on this update. Um, and I will go through all of these three specific parts. Um, the first part is called recalc required bones. Um, and that's the specific LOD generation of the skeletal mesh. It determines basically what kind of bones should be the ones that's actually sent to the renderer and in general updated through the animation loop. Uh, we simply cache the results. It's a one line, call this thing, cache it in the bone container, and everything is happy. Um, the second part, which is way more bigger, but I would imagine way more people in this room probably have experienced by, is this evaluate animation call. So uh, evaluate animation is primarily the second step in an anim animation updating, where it fills in all the bones that is required for the mesh to be animated. Um, and probably a lot of people have already optimized the animation blueprints by natifying certain key animation graphs that cause a lot of performance. Uh, if you haven't, please do. Like You're going to save a lot by just simply uh, overriding this thing and driving a little bit of basic animation logic. Um, and what we did, to a large extent, is just do this for our notification loop. Um, so to explain exactly what these, um, like what the animation vim we needed to notify, it was quite a simple one. Uh, we read from gameplay input where the, where the mesh should be rotated in jaw and roll. Uh, we have this transform bone node that kind of attaches to specific bones. Um, and then we have a very simple locomotion loop, uh, or locomotion loop, I guess, like just a simple animation graph thing where we have the customization animation playing, potential shooting, and some idle. Uh, there is some other small things, but this is kind of the core animation graph that we're trying to natify. Um, I won't go through every single node and how to implement all of those things. Um, I will just suggest a very anti-pattern, which is to copy-paste whatever functionality you need from those, uh, both because there are like five lines to do. Uh, they're very self-contained and contain what their own internal implementation is. Um, and if you are integrating and noticing that there are some stuff around, something has changed, it's probably very easy to change it back. Um, the second part, which might not be completely the same, is that uh, we, as we don't have an animation graph, we need to define the data somehow to play these different animations or in general know what our blend time was or whatever. Um, so what we did is we basically created this big giant data table, and then for each row we kind of had like the asset name for the mesh we were trying to duplicate. And then we do, would do a lookup, find a specific animation to play or whatever blend time to apply, and we would just simply do that. And then we had that across all ones, also deleting then 150 animation blueprints that were specifically for each of these individual meshes. So it was a very nice way of us also reducing content. Um, and an additional thing that I also want to mention is we are bulk updating these different meshes in just one component. This means that we can also do a lot of cool data-oriented techniques and also be a way more cache-oriented in regards for how we're updating this. Um, simply us, of us creating a very nice cache-oriented loop to run these sub-meshes, we saved around like half a millisecond based on previously component updating, running obviously and doing a bunch of cache misses, and for us having a very clear bone updating loop, which is really nice. Um, but in, in the end, our evaluate call is very, very similar towards how it would be for a native animation loop. We're simply just not using the animation instance, but having our own internal object. And that's the second largest point. Um, the third one is quite small, but uh, you can probably imagine that we have all these sub-meshes. Um, 
However, as they're all part of one specific skeletal mesh component, they have no idea in the world where they're supposed to locate it, uh, be located in. Um, so what we do is we have to somehow figure out a way when we are changing these specific bones that we have calculated for all submeshes, like to what their world's position is. Um, and we do this by, in the specific skeletal mesh merger, we associate an additional index where you can do a lookup for how to find itself specifically in its own mesh. Um, and this is, to a large extent, multiple animated objects into one, and in general, how we were able to um, solve the specific problem. So to go through the specific thing again, uh, we had a problem with our component count. Uh, we extended the skeletal mesh merger by duplicating all the, sub, all the meshes in the skeletal mesh merger and then associating them with one specific root node. And then we created our own animation update object and could, like not using the animation instance and piping through the different um, steps that were required for us to animate and fill this mesh. And we also saved 10 milliseconds. Um, this means that we started at 21. Uh, we gain 1.5 by having tuning variables, and then we save 10 milliseconds by reducing our component quite, count quite massively and in general batching and doing good cache updating of bones. So we ended up at 9.5 by average frame time. Um, and this for me is kind of the key point about what I'm trying to say for every single gem, is sometimes you're going to have to find your specific key optimizations for your game. I would say don't be too afraid of sometimes opening up the engine and finding your specific key optimizations for your game, because to really get the most out of your game and for you to in general have fun with your game, um, you're gonna probably going to have to do this. Um, and that's the conclusion of Gem2, use an multiple animated objects into one. Cool, so let's talk about the third one. Um, and before I start really talking about the third one, there's also some special thanks. The uh, first one is to Isaac Ashton, um, and also to Oliver Stubenrach, who I work together with on this stuff, and it's really cool. Uh, we've been using network pooling for a very long time, I think like probably around three years or something. Um, and yeah, we really like the solution. Um, so to do this, to start this gem, I'm going to show the same video, uh, but talk about other things. Um, <laughs> so you can probably notice a couple of things that happens um, in Dreadnought uh, that is kind of the same. Uh, we shoot projectiles, certainly, but we shoot 20, 30, 40, dif the same of the projectile. The only difference is kind of the time and space and the location of where it got fired and potentially who is firing them. Um, and this can be sometimes quite expensive. It can be up to like two to four milliseconds expensive. Um, and it, it obviously depends on the actor. A couple of them can be super quick. Uh, but what I also really want to denote is it might not be like just spawn actor, uh, but it can also be that, for instance, you created a bunch of actors that have physics, and then those physics objects got inserted to the physics scene, and then it might be a spike on the physics thread in, instead of the main game thread. Um, so a lot of times these things can be hidden and in general not really completely obvious for the p person. Uh, also, it's not only gameplay events that triggers these things. Um, if you remember my previous example of network relevancy with Joe and Sam, well, um, when they are moving through the world, they're obviously creating a lot of objects based on relevancy that gets continuously created and happens all the time. Um, especially if you've been working on open world games or thinking about how to work on open world games, uh, this is like a pattern that is really like happening a lot of times. Um, so we wanted to optimize this. Um, and what we did, and I would imagine a lot of people have already done also as third party developers, is use something that's called pooling. Um, it's a simple art of just reusing objects over and over again instead of destroying them explicitly and then creating them again. Um, so, um, and the, it's kind of a straightforward process. Like, what we simply do is we create two different managers for either components or actors, um, and they kind of store all the objects that they have ever pulled or are active in the game. Um, this, uh, every single object that gets pulled has a specific pool index um, stored in either actor or uh, base component. And they, it has basically an ID lookup in the manager to find its own individual place uh, so we can have an O1 lookup. And in general, also know that it is a pooled actor because if it's put to index none, then we know it's not a pooled actor. Um, what we also do, because we are con uh, basically controlling the whole creation loop of these specific actors and reusing them, is we can do a really cool technique by adding them to GC ignore list. Um, as mentioned previously, the, the garbage collection system is way more optimized and awesome now, but still you can help it along by saying that, hey, for these pool actors, which might be, I don't know, 50% of the objects in your game, 
uh, you can tell garbage collection to ignore those because you're taking care of them, which is pretty cool. Uh, it's, uh, it's some epic lingo of about add to root instead of gc ignore list, but yeah. Um, and then the interface is pretty easy. Um, instead of calling spawn actor, it's simply a static function where you pipe in the U class. Um, it could be a blueprint class, it could be whatever. Um, you just pipe it in there and you get your actor back. Um, you can put hard limits into your pooling, so you could say that we only want 100 AI characters, and then you could either determine if you want to go above that limit or return null and allow gameplay code to handle it. Uh, we do both. Um, now, there's a couple of more techniques that we do for pooling. Um, the first one is obviously initializing the registration. Um, so the different actors and components that we use are all unique and have their own little behavior. And we allow them to define that um, by on activated in pool and on deactivated in pool. And these can exist in blueprints or they can exist in native code. Then the second part, so, uh, and I guess also important to mention is that we um, hook into some engine function and make sure that for all the components that the actor has that it also specifically calls this one. Um, so these are the basic initialization function. Oh, w uh, one more thing that I think is important to mention specifically here as well is that um, as we are creating these actors and then general storing them, your normal begin play and all those ones won't be triggered again. I guess you could make enough engine changes to specifically make that happen, but that I would not recommend. Just try primarily putting your initialization functions here, which is pretty cool because then you have a lot of the initialization kind of defined in one specific set of functions. Then I'll talk about destroy. Um, so there's a lot of epic systems that want to destroy our fantastic pooled actors. Um, and what, you, what we simply do is we hook up right in the beginning of the destroy call and return them back to the pool instead. So it's just five lines of changes to make sure that the engine API doesn't interfere with your specific use case. Um, the third point I want to talk about is pooling states. Uh, because you might think that the state that objects go through in pooling might be very trivial, where it starts first to be in the pool, so we created the actor and potentially can be reused later, um, and then it can be an active actor. Um, and once gameplay or something have decided that this actor is no longer valid, uh, we would specifically return it back to the pool, right? Well, we don't do this explicitly. Um, if you remember previously from my example with destroy, um, the normal behavior when you destroy an actor is that we wait, you wait for a garbage collection, and then it nulls out all the references that previously wanted this thing to have. Um, we were working on a game of, for like two years before implementing pooling, um, and we had a lot of different subsystems that had direct object pointers directly to our fantastic pooled actor that we were trying to pool. Um, and if we would uh, just explicitly return it back to the pool after running the initialization, this would mean that these things would mess up this actor and potentially put it in a state to not be able to be reused. Um, and those bugs are also horrible to fix. Um, so what we did is we in introduced an additional state, uh, this state we call return to the pool that you could put to an actor, um, and then we would basically set an explicit object property on this actor and wait for garbage collection to run. Um, and then we would wait for garbage collection, which would then null out all the references exactly like the destroy call does and return it back to the pool. Um, and this for us kind of was really cool. It both made a lot of the other system not really have to manage. Uh, obviously, we piped in this stuff also into the is valid check for T-weak object pointers and a lot of other places where the engine in general validates objects to see if they are proper gameplay objects or about to be killed. Um, if you know mark for pending kill, then it's sort of the same behavior of that. Um, then I want to talk about network pooling. Um, so network pooling is hard by itself because um, you know the network creation where you move around in the level and you're creating a lot of different objects. Well, we didn't want that with our pool objects. So what we did is we marked the actor or component as always relevant. Uh, this meant that it was never uh, destroyed. Uh, however, obviously from the beginning it would cost way longer server time because we would need to check this actor all the time if it had properties that's been changed. So we excluded it from the server relevancy loop while being in the pool and in general getting this for free, which was pretty nice. Um, the second point is this pooling state management. Uh, so you might be curious about how we kind of make the return to pool flow work for, um, work for uh, replicated actors or components. Uh, well, what we do is we, a lot extent, simulate the same behavior that Epic does for their normal property replication, where it like, acts between clients and server that this has happened, and then we run the garbage collection on a frequency by 30, uh, 30 seconds to make sure that they s really quickly go back to the pool and we can reuse them again. Um, and then the third thing that's very important in regards to network pooling is to manage your replication order. 
Um, so you guys might not 100% know, but it's kind of obvious, is that you have this do rep li lifetime. Um, and if these specific functions are tied to, like, sorry, if these specific properties are tied to certain new functions that are supposed to be triggered once this state has changed, um, then make sure you set your order properly if you are dependent on this specific thing for initialization, uh, because obviously this one will hit first and then the second one will hit uh, afterwards. So you're going to need to manage that properly. Um, I guess what's also important is that if you have a mix between RPCs, like the multicast function I showed before, and this property replication, they themselves won't be ordered with each other. So you might have an RPC hitting first or a property replication hitting first. And both of these you have to juggle. Uh, we, in general, just moved all our initialization code to property replication, and then it kind of worked fine. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about pooling is, in general, pre-pool versus lazy pool. So what you can do with... Um, so th these are basically just two techniques about how you would set up your pooling. Would you either create all the actors in the beginning of the game, or would you wait for gameplay input to actually request these actors and then store them later for reuse afterwards? And they are both valid techniques, and I would use both. Um, just really keep in mind memory and loading times. And this is for both of these things. Because what's super cool, and you might not think of this for pre-pooling, is that, for instance, if you know your memory budget and you're working on a very memory-tight platform, like, for instance, Android or console, then what you can do is say, our budgets just accept 100 AI characters, and we will only spawn 100 AI characters. And instead of doing some magic in spawn actor or in general regulate your gameplay system, you can specifically pipe it into the pooling system and find your specific way of regulating it through there. Um, so, <laughs> so to give a summary, I have no idea what that triggered. Um, we, we have an issue with expensive objects getting created over and over again. Um, we use pooling specifically to do this. Um, we created a lot of different techniques to in general manage these specific behaviors. Uh, we had internal ID referencing on the object and components. Uh, we added them to the root set so the garbage collection doesn't care about them un until we have the pooling states. Uh, we created directly virtual functions for initialize and deinitialize. Uh, we implemented a reference nulling specifically in the destroy step to make sure that other gameplay systems are not directly interfering with it. And we, uh, in general, solve network management by making the actor always relevant, managing a replication order, um, and also, in general, acting the different pooling states that existed. Uh, but in general, what I really want to also emphasize is really pool what you need. Uh, a couple of objects or a couple of UMG widgets might be super quick to create, and those you shouldn't pool because sometimes it can lead to way more larger complexity, especially network relevancy. Um, so really open profile. Uh, you're probably going to have to pool some, but some you can just allow. Um, and this is basically it. So just to summarize, I went through three specific gems. Uh, these were the performance tracker, the multiple animated components into one, and network pooling. Um, and what I want to say is that all of these things and a lot of other gems I could have presented here during these 45 minutes were in development together with Epic using UDN and Answer Hub. Um, if you're working on any of these kinds of things, or in general thinking about going in this direction, please just reach out to UDN. They're there to help you not only to implement the things, but also just to give you suggestions about how you potentially could implement them. Uh, but in the end, all of these gems that I presented primarily presents one specific message um, in the optimization gems from Jaeger, that you have to find like, the key optimizations for your game. Uh, sometimes you're going to have to open up the engine and find your kind of key optimizations. Um, and with that, uh, my talk is done, and I'd like to thank you all for listening. <laughs>